the mirror your wall keeps you from staring into the darkness and visions keeping you awake in fairy tales you try to stay they echo back at you like a chorus am i still too young to know when i'm living for a ghost spinning fables when the brightest colors fading stories fail you when you're grown can't hide us from the fall but my love for you is bold take it all i found my old friends back at home and for my father i had all the answers paid a price for pretending heroes villains i had made they're all i have left of my day in one more page of unwritten endings Am I still too young to know I've been living for a ghost? In my mind, the brightest colors are unfaded. Stories fail you when you're grown. Don't believe them anymore. My love for you is bold, but it can't save you. My love for you is bold, but it won't change you. My love for you is bold. Take it all. How long can I be golden if stories I've told can save my love stories all been told can save you from it all my love for you is bold just take Bobby? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. By the way, for anybody else out there who <coughs> has a guitar or an accordion or a do <coughs> lurking in the background of your uh, <laughs> setting and you'd like to be a part of the music, just reach out to Bobby via the chat. We're always looking for new voices, new artists, new musicians. But you're here because you know that Roseanne Bosch and Trung Lee are two of the best, most innovative, most thoughtful, most human-centered designers in the world. Uh, what you may not know is they've also been friends for a long time and have, I think it's safe to say, both really influenced the way the other thinks about their very important and very unique work. So as some of you may have seen in what I said before, this is an opportunity for us, first and foremost, to just get to be flies on the wall. But as always in these meetings, it's also an opportunity to participate. So Lee is gonna be facilitating the conversation with Roseanne and all of us are encouraged to make our own uh, ideas or questions known by way of the chat, and I'll do my best to kind of keep it all going. But um, without any further ado, to, oh, to, to really give the introduction to Roseanne, I want to introduce my friend and business partner, Chung Lee. Hey, Sam. Hi, everyone. It's good to see uh, a lot of faces coming together. Uh, and um, 
for that introduction. I'm not sure if I put myself on the same platform as who said. <laughs> First of all, yeah, I you do. A long time ago, when I had a chance to write a blog for Fast Company and was in search of uh, amazing designers out there in the landscape of uh, designing learning spaces, um, I discovered Roseanne, and this is when Roseanne was still part of another firm, I believe. And what I found so remarkable about that story was that um, part of the design process was that they literally moved into the school and lived with the teachers and the students for six weeks. Um, and um, I would say throughout the years, because of that discovery, um, Roseanne's work um, have always inspired me in the work that we're doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and um, through that is how we were connected and became friends um, and certainly um, been keeping in touch these years. Um, and once in a while we run into each other, whether it's in Denmark or whether it's in um, Colorado. Um, that was the reason why Roseanne and, and Stephanie Pace Marshall were roommates because we had a retreat there and it was really wonderful. Uh, but we're here to learn as much as we can about Roseanne. Um, and and I, I wouldn't call this a facilitated so facilitation because I, I, I feel like um, what comes best between the two of us is just having a conversation together. Um, and then, you know, maybe this is a, a fishbowl event where you're just um, listening in and, and certainly uh, I'm going to be looking for really interesting questions um, to throw into the mix uh, as I look at the chat. But Roseanne, I, I, I want to start from the very beginning. Um, you know, as, as a, um, a designer that's really advocating for play and wonder and curiosity, I'm, I'm curious about like, what was your learning experience like as a child, right? What, what, what does that look like um, that may or might not have some connection to the work and how you think and how you design now? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, as a child, there's a long period and there's a lot of learning, uh, I mean, in many different ways. So I don't really think you can say, you know, one particular way. Um, before I, I answer your question, I actually would like to say something about all the introductions, because it's always nice with all the introductions. I was just thinking, you know, like how we met and, and this whole, you know, kind of uh, connection. And the beauty is that when I was a roommate of Stephanie, I mean, now that we are going to do this as a kind of conversation, you know, uh, we were talking and I know that she's been talking often about this, you know, uh, about the, the song line, the landscape, and, you know, in Australia and so on. And in a way, you know, uh, our, you know, friendship, if you want, you know, is a little bit like that. I see it a little bit like that. We run into each other actually in Copenhagen first time, you know, and sometimes you meet people and, uh, you know, no matter that you're on the other side of the world or you resonate with people and, and then things happen, you know, and it's like then suddenly I haven't seen you or spoken to you for like a couple of years. And then suddenly something pops up in my universe of something you've been doing uh, somewhere. It's like, oh, so inspiring. Oh, yeah. And it's like a conversation, even though we don't speak, you know, I mean, it's like a conversation that, you know, continues. And then and then I reach out and then you write something to me and then I write something back and then we talk. And it's like, a, yeah, I don't know, it's like an energy or a song line in space and time and, and things like that. So I, I believe that we we create a. You know relationships with people that cross some kind of weird i mean i don't i'm not want to sound too new age like but uh, you know some kind of energy and you connect so uh, i think that you are one of my uh, songline pals uh, <laughs> so but apart from it my learning experience as a child i don't know i think i had good and bad and all kind of stuff uh, types of uh, learning experiences over a long period of time I mean, my relationship with school was not always the best, I must say. I changed school quite often, especially when I got older. So I had some frustrations there. So that probably reflects itself in my work today. But as a, in a short version, I also went to a Montessori school for a period of time where I had a positive, also negative experiences and so on. So I think that we're all kind of culminating all these experiences throughout our life and all together, you know, that become, yeah, they add up to the personality and the things you are, you know. I can tell you who my hero was as a child. I think that's really something. My hero was a little bit Scandinavian, you know. We called her a Pippi Langkaus, uh, you know, the, I don't know how you call her in English. We say Pippi Langstrumpf, yeah. You know, the girl from Astrid Lincoln with their red hair and the, 
the tail stuffing. Yeah, yeah. And I always wanted my mom to make these, you know, and she was like, it wouldn't stick, you know, I mean, it wouldn't stick out, you know, long stocking, thank you. You know, it wouldn't stick out and I would like do all kinds of things and put iron in it. So she was like, oh, she was my hero, you know? And I think that that is today very much in my work as well, because it's this feeling of, uh, you can do anything you want, you know? I mean, you don't need adults, you know, please don't make me an adult too fast. That was the whole thing, you know? That tried to keep a child forever. And uh, so in that sense, yes, it reflects itself even today in my work, you know? Because, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, well, yes. now, I have, yeah, now I have that, uh, that image of, of you with the, with the pigtails on either side. But, um, you know, I, I'm always interested in, in those kind of early learning experiences because I always compare it to my, um, my Catholic school's upbringing. <laughs> and, and I can compare those stories any day to what, you know, what it means when you said negative learning experience um, growing up. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious because you, um, you know, obviously you're, you're known around the world as, as being one of um, the, the best when it comes to designing learning spaces. Um, but you, you come from a contem contemporary artist um, education or practice. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious, like help, help, um, help us understand what was that connection and what led from one to the other? Well, I think it's very important actually. I don't think I would have done today what I do if it wasn't for my my art background I in a way I feel still like an artist I mean I don't really distinguish because it's something you have inside but there's one important thing you learn at least I did uh at the uh you know when I actually the first school I actually seriously liked was the the art academy I have to say it's the first time I actually enjoyed you know I really felt joy of, of being connected to school but apart from that is that um, I think that when you're in the art practice, the contemporary art practice I grow up into, because our contemporary art, as you know, is also, you know, has many different sizes and perspectives to it. Um, I guess that it was very um, fundamental that we, you question yourself why. I mean, basically, you have a very multidisciplinary or a very open, holistic way of looking at the world, you know. I mean, you don't distinguish in different ways of researching or, or you know, trying to investigate in something. And at the same time, you have this constant you know, putting in the center of everything you do, your curiosity and your, your sense of wonder, if you want, and questioning yourself why. Now, this has led me today to two different, I think, very important uh, parts of my practice, yeah? Because I have a, I have a, I also, ha I also have a company with a lot of other people where I'm responsible for partially as well. And because if not, we would not be doing, be able to do all these projects of this kind of size and in so many countries and so on. So, Part of it, I think, is why we have a different culture. So you also become kind of a motor in the culture of, of your, your studio is that this allowing this question, this questioning of everything, you know, in the middle. And in a way, it's also what you do with school. It's like just putting a, you can say, you know, the learner at the center or the person or the child or, you know, in the center of. And then from here, from the inside of yourself, you look at the world, you sense the world, you observe. And you wonder, you question, you say, why? And this, this kind of, you know, it's a very basic thing. And I think it comes from an art practice because it allows yourself to first ask the question, uh, prioritize this curiosity as one of the most important things or drive in, in everything you do. And then, of course, afterwards, take this first step into starting to kind of approach you know and think of okay how do i do this and how do i investigate and and oh no take another path a path you know and then you get this kind of mix max of conclusions and you also allow yourself to combine everything with everything basically you have a much more holistic and open view of the world and out of it comes a whole different practice a whole different approach a whole different way of thinking of working another a different way of prioritizing which i think is very important in our work I mean, our projects would never be the way they are if we would take and forgiven the, the way or we're supposed to prioritize what we do. <laughs> you know, and this is a little bit the Bippy Langstrom, but that's a, we're also a little bit rebellious, you know, because we don't do as we are told and we don't necessarily put on top of the list of important things, the things they do. We actually often went, turn it the other way around, you know. 
So, I mean, and you know that because, I mean, when we, when we are working with schools, I mean, the most important thing is the kids, the school, you know, and how they can develop and grow and, and how do you do that? And then you get a lot of very different answers to that question if you actually take that question serious. And, you, the, and the beauty of it is if you put that question, if you manage to sort of create a space with the people you work with, this can be the teachers, the parents, the children, the municipality, the minister of education, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. If you can, you allow for this kind of co-creation processes and you, you manage to create a space around this process of, of design where everybody contributes and everybody feels equally important and every, everybody has this openness and feels that they can allow themselves to wonder why, and come up with all kind of, you know, and then exchange ideas, then you often see people grow in this process and out of it come results that everybody can agree on is the only right solution. And then when you actually end up and then people look at our work and like, how come they always ask you to do such a different creative things? And we're like, it's not us. They don't ask us like that. They actually ask us something else. But in the process, the people started to create it that way. So I really believe that that actually, I don't really think that, I mean, I don't sound strange people say, oh, you're this designer. And I, I actually don't think I'm a, I'm a very good designer, to be honest. <laughs> I do like my work. <laughs> I mean, don't take this wrong. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it's the process. Like maybe talk more about that process because it, it feels like um, it's a collective artistic endeavor, right? When you're inviting the community into it and, and but but like take us take us down that path a little more. What what is that what is that condition? It's the same way that you know Bobby's um, song put us in a state of mind, like set us in a mood. Um, I, it feels like your process does the same, but at a much larger scale and a much more. There's a sense of rigor and purpose um, behind it. So maybe maybe give us a sense of an experience when you when you take this group of people through that process. I won't be able to do that just like that. I have to be honest. I can't, you know, promise you that now I'm doing, you know, with the flick of my fingers, you know, we get this experience, you know, because it's not that easy to be honest. Um, especially because we are in a very, uh, I would say. Um, Unidimensional, I mean, single dimensional or unidimensional linear way of communication right now, which is the digital Zoom meeting. You can do it in a Zoom context, but it really requires actually some preparation. I mean, we have been uh, forced to do so, you know, uh, because of Corona crisis and we had several projects, but I can describe one for you. Maybe that's nicer. I can also maybe, you know, I actually, you asked me to Yesterday, we had a short uh, connection, you know, to prepare for today. And uh, for five minutes, I was a bit in a hurry. And then you say, okay, just find five images of what drives you, which is a totally impossible task. <laughs> I cannot do that. Anyway, so I was like, oh, 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 this and that. So that's, I'm not, if you want, I can, I have something prepared. I can share some images and then like, you know, then I'll pick the one that is relevant for the conversation. But one of the stories I was thinking of was, is a project we do in Uruguay which is a very, they're very nice people. We call it the ecosystem, the Garson, uh, eco, it's, a, we, we, it's, design, it's a design which has been driven now forward as an ecosystem. So we have this beautiful plot of land. It's really big, it's, it's nature, it's, there's nothing there, you know? Um, and, uh, and we have to, and we have this group of people that got together and say, okay, we want something else for our children and, uh, and let's create a school here. So then, of course, we start to have this dialogue with these people and, and their families and have children and the people involved and they start to employ teachers and stuff like that. And we talk about all kind of things and, and we're do, we, we, we need to do this digitally. So we come up with all kinds of, of beautiful things and we create it into a, we give them, we start to do these digital workshops and we give them assignments to do with the kids because I can't. Be, my people we can't do it with the kids so we actually give the people you know over there assignments to do with the kids we give them a lot of photos to show them to create references we make them build with lego and models and sands and sticks and things and photograph it and send it to us and and we and we start to engage in this kind of storytelling with the parents and the kids and at a certain moment we end up with a kind of a rough layout of this because this is a huge plot of land yeah it's really really big 
And they say, uh, okay, well, they love our design, but they're a little bit afraid because, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's quite a long road from the road to the school. You have to, there's like four or 500 meters, I don't know, in yards and things like that, the American way. But uh, I don't know, let's say for an adult, let's say 10 minute walk. Yeah, for an adult. So, and they say, oh, no, no, Uruguayan parents, they, they don't do that. They drive the car up to the front and they drop on the kids and they drive away. You know, and you can't have a school where you actually, you know, I mean, you have to walk, you know. And we're like, no, 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 we don't want to destroy this beautiful piece of land with a road. I mean, this can't be. And then we have this discussion with them and we said, OK, well, let's go discover the land with the kids. So we give them this assignment with their children and they gather all these children they go on an excursion and we, we, we plotted with, a, we, we made a guy with a drone, make a plan of this land. And then they have sticks with little flags and we tell them and they make them plot these little flags and then they measure how long did it take and the kids, they register their experiences. And on the basis of that, we plotted the land, you know, together with them and we create this experience mapping and we took it in, we designed it. And this is, for example, the process we're in, you know, so, and this is a little bit to explain to you. Now in this process, these people grow, you know? So now, mm. you know, they're now, and then we also discover different typologies of landscape in Uruguay with a landscape architect, which we reestablished there and, and things like that. So it becomes a whole, the whole, whole thing is like a building and landscape design, the whole thing of those. Now what happens is that in this course, people change their mind. The parents, when they go there with the kids, they completely change their mind. So today, now we're one, you know, we're like I don't know, nine, 10 months ahead, you know? I mean, now today, they're just like, they could not imagine. Did I say that? No, I didn't. No, 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 no. I would never, never, you know, and so on. So, and this is the thing. In the process, you, you ping pong and, and people change their perception and they forget. I mean, our memory is pretty bad about this. So, so your, your, your normality changes. And then together you make this journey and your normality change. And then you suddenly come at a different point. So... And I do, I mean, design does matter. Don't understand me wrong. And I, I am proud of what we design. And there's a reason why it's so different. And it's it's really giving people a, a, a eyesight on how to, it's also kind of showing the people, it's, it's also showing that the world could be different. I think that is very important. Yeah. If you are kind of limiting yourself, it's like, hey, it doesn't have to be the way we think it is. It can actually be different, you know? And I mean, and, and in a way we take people and then, and then you meet people in different places. If I, we work in China, you know, I mean, very different, very difficult in the Corona. I mean, we, I don't know, German, German, Germans are very tough to change perception and imagination and allow themselves some little flint of, uh, of fantasy really, you know, working. I saw actually, uh, a friend of mine or uh, from Belgium, or uh, I know he was in the names at the beginning. We work in Belgium. They're very different again. You know, they're more creative. So, I mean, you meet people where they are and then you mm, take them on this journey. And then suddenly so many more things are possible. Um, I don't know if it explains what you wanted to know. but Well, the other thing that I wanted to get ultimately is to this book. Now, um, this is, this is Roseanne's latest book. Can can we buy this? Because yes, you, you can. You were generosity yeah. to see this, but it's it's like available on Amazon that we can go. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. yes. Perfect. Right. So let's get to one of the why. Right. So, mm. um, in in kind of the what I what I read is kind of a manifesto that you've written here. Mm. Right. So it second is. paragraph: the way we educate our children reflects the way we think of ourselves. Yes. Right. So why are so many schools designed as instrument of control? Yes. How do we unpack that? Why? Like, tell me how you do it. How do you, because every time that we, we enter into a, um, a design process, when, mm -hmm. when we engage with a community, most often it comes as an us versus them propositions, right? Um, the early adopter versus the one that is never going to change. And, and that happens not only in terms of communities, but also in terms of culture, as you just mentioned. It's all along that spectrum somehow. But it, it's back to that question. Why are so many schools designed as instrument of control? <sighs> You want to know the, you want me to answer the why or 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 you want me to, to give you some yeah. you know feedback on the one that always the guy that goes in front and the one that's like oh we don't want to go yeah. 
tell us tell us all of that. Tell us some of those stories that you have encountered in terms of how that question is being tackled by each of the communities that you have touched and worked with throughout the years. Is there anything? Well, that, I, yeah, I have to say you. I have to say one thing, and this might not be nice to hear for you. I mean, it's not always an, uh, you know, a, a pleasure. It's not always a pleasurable process. And I also have to say it's a fight, you know. I mean, not, always, not a bad, like a negative, like an aggressive, aggressive fight, you know. But it is a, it is a, it's uphill, you know, and it's not always necessarily taking the, the easy road. Now, first of all, I think that, you know, that there is a, some, they, I mean, to be honest, I think that the, the wish to control other people or our children in a, in a system, you know, is also based on a culture we've had for a long time. I mean, in a way, you also have to realize that schools, in a way, to make them, you know, industrialized, factory, the factory model of a school has also been extremely effective, you know, has been extremely effective in bringing down poverty because it's sort of broader. Uh, generalized, you know, uh, system to the world that allowed a lot of people to become, uh, you know, to learn how to read and write, which before they had, did not have access to. That was an exclusive thing. I mean, you know, um, it's not that far, not that long time ago that certain people or girls were not allowed to learn how to read and write because that would just harm them for it to name something and so on and so forth. So I think that, you know, that's not only bad. The problem is that things have moved on. You know, that's one part. And the other thing is that, uh, how to say, um, I just, okay, I think that it's all about, in a way that we, it's all about trust, okay? It's about human trust. I mean, if I trust you, I don't need to control you, okay? Um, if I don't trust you, I need to make sure that nothing goes wrong, yeah? that you are not going to steal or you're not going to attack me or whatever. So in a way, it really reflects an illness, I think, which we have in our societies because we don't trust each other and we don't trust our children for certain. So we have to force them to learn and we have to force them to, I don't know, get up, do what they're supposed to do, get back uh, and so, so forth, you know. So in a way, this mis it's the mistrust in our society that's reflected in the school. It's the mistrust towards the teacher that they will do their job, you know, so that I have to make sure that they're for one hour from 10 to 11 in this room doing this particular things with this particular kids, you know. It's the old factory model where you had to clock in and clock out because if not, I did not believe you were going to be at work. I mean, somebody has to look, the teacher has to look at you because if not, you might not do what you're supposed to do and you're probably, what, going to be lazy? Going to be playing? Going to be doing... You know, what actually, what are we so afraid of? So the thing is that the model of control, in my opinion, reflects the lack of trust. Yeah? And not only in the other, it also reflects the lack of trust in ourself. Now, now we're going a bit down the philosophical way, but it is true, you know, because in a way, and that's why I say our educational system does not only reflect the way we see society, it also reflects the way we see ourselves. Yeah, we don't trust ourselves. Ergo, we don't trust our children. Aren't our children what is kind of the most pre pre uh, pre precious, the most close to ourselves? So we create the systems of controlling our children, the school, society, the neighbor, and actually, it's because we mistrust ourselves. Okay, now we went out to a row. Has not much to do with this time, but I really think so. So I feel a little bit, you know, I feel a little bit uh, like this, uh, yeah, Pippi Lang, uh, long stocking, you know, uh, a bit a uh, little rebellion that doesn't want to grow up, but is in a way also telling the truth, you know. And I think that in this processes we engage in, we sort of take people on this route. Um, and then there is a very important part. Yeah, which has nothing to do with all that and has everything to do with all that. Um, we were talking in the beginning, very short. I mean, Stephanie, when she introduced me, she said the word dream. Yeah, I believe that when we talk about wonder, um, we talk about play. I mean, we also talk about dream. You know, dreams is this, you can say, okay, you can go very much into what dreams is, but it's also just imagining something else. It's daring to imagine something else. It's daring to think beyond certain limits and so on. Let yourself go into a, you know, let, your, let yourself fly, your mind fly away, you know, to daydream, to dream, et cetera. And I think that one of the, the big parts we do in our collaborative processes with schools or communities is that we actually create a space of dreaming. 
you know, where people are allowed to dream. And when the moment, so this is very important. We always, you know, trying to create away this, take away this seriousness or or what needs. No, no, no. Let's let's just dream together. You know, and at the moment we start, we get this sense of dreaming together. It's another word for playing. People sometimes get a bit scared of the play because they're this is not for fun and stuff like that. You know, and we're like, yes, it is, but okay. We, we hide it. We said we, we're dreaming together. And when, when we start dreaming together at a certain moment and people start to get into the dream, from the dream, we derive what I would say, you know, a drive for creating something. Suddenly we see it. You know, oh, wow, look at that. Wow. Ah, I want to go there. You know, look at this meadow. Look at these flowers. You know, and then you dream. Suddenly you hit something in your dream. You go like, wow. Oh, do you think? What if? No, yes, no, oh, and then, you know, and this energy, this wonder, this sense of wonder, and then you see something beautiful, and then you, it links you to the next and to the next, and it's this drive, this energy, this, this allowing yourself to imagine, I think that drives our projects, and then what happens is that it crystallizes at a certain moment, so we create schools that are mountain landscapes, and, you know, you can hide inside, and because we do that, it suddenly allows for you know, I mean, it allows for play, you know, it allows for imagining the world a bit different, thinking that, hey, things don't have to be the way they are, and maybe I could actually, and then, etc. So it opens up possibilities, it opens up door, it opens up doors, and it creates the possibility for, for different typologies of people to find their place inside. Mm -hmm. And this is then the next step, because, you know, what of the things that the controlling system does is, is that it kind of treats people that they're more or less equal we're not equal not meaning that we don't have equal rights and all that stuff but the beauty is that if we actually find ourselves in our differentiation because it's a richness you know and and then we can we do some things together and oh yeah and then we play you are this and i'm that and oh and then we can build together you know and this is really nice you know and 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 to and to feel safe in this this kind of community of of different all the younger you know, different type of people with different, I don't know, introvert, extrovert, you know, moving a lot like me, moving not so much like you. I love, I love kind of the, the, what, what's in my mind right now is that that, that contradiction between the meaning of the word control um, and the creative expressions that is now manifested in the work that you do. That's really is about dreaming, right? But um, I, I would love to open up these conversations if there's um, any burning questions that you have for Roseanne, um, go at it. Anyone? Anyone? I'm not reading the chat. Please tell me the questions because yeah. I can't read and talk at the same time. Yeah, any, hard, anyone you know? have a, a, a why questions for Roseanne at this point? All right, so let's let's talk more about that, Roseanne. Now let's let's circle back into um, these physical environment, right? That you're mm -hmm. creating, um, and and it does. It's it's a very specific sense of aesthetic and language. Um, for me, it is about surrounding children with beauty, um, but it's also on a philosophical side really allow you to see what does it mean when we create a place for play and wonder and curiosity. I'm, I'm, I'm curious in like, what, what are you doing? Like, how are you, how are you emerging? Um, and, and I know that the process has something to do with that because some of the idea comes from the people that you're interacting with, but as, as a designer, as, you know, because us as an artist, most of the time, we, we do begin in sitting in front of an empty sheet of paper and there's nothing more intimidating, right? In that creative process. But I'm, I'm curious, how do you start? How do you start to make that translation, right? With this deep philosophy of like learning through play and learning through wondering. Well, you know, um, I can, you know, wait, I'm just gonna, I mean, first of all, you know, like I said, we start with a conversation and creating a space of dreaming together, you know. Then the next thing I think is that we start to actually, we make often, and that's actually quite funny, we create a language, 
if you want to. And this language is often a combination of maybe words and images or symbols or colors or, or concepts yeah? that we then put on the table. Why do we do this? Because you also need to take people a little bit by their hand that you go from one concept to the other. And in a way you have to give them a, a, an, um, you know, the, the, it's okay. Not the feeling of control is maybe not the right word, but the feeling of that they can, it's like you give letters and then you have an alphabet which you can construct with. Now, before you were speaking, you were not even actually having a language. Now I give you some letters and you can start constructing. Why I'm saying this is because in a way, we're very one dimensional when we design, most architects and designers, if you ask me, you know, um, they're not designing three dimensional, maybe a little bit, but they're absolutely not aware of how your body interacts with the spaces that we that we are surrounded with. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, well, it depends. There's some discussions, and you know, between seven or eight different typologies of senses, and this is the apparatus, if you want. This is our way. I mean, me as a person uh, to communicate with the world, to intercept the world. Now, what comes in through my senses, you know, forms my thoughts. Yeah, forms my my imagination, what I even can imagine or what I even can think of. In that sense, it's actually many, many years ago. I mean, when we had our meeting in Colorado, we were talking about books. And I was talking about this one particular book that for me at that moment was an eye opener. This is about two, is this was in the year 2000, I think I read it, which was about philosophy in the flashes a very, a very long time ago. But about, for me at that time, it was really an eye opener about this idea that, yeah, but the world, and I'm just going to do the thing you can't do in Zoom, I'm going to stretch my arms. But in a way, the world is not bigger then, you know, the Michelangelo thing, you know, and at my body. Um, now, this is actually coming from a background as a sculpture, when you start to design things that actually in a way, or Le Pau Boucher, if you want, you know, that everything relates to the sizes of, of, of you when you talk about size. But it's also the size of smell, you know, uh, of how you surround your world or what you listen, you know, you also have a sound uh, a perception of space as much as you, I mean, even more actually than visual and so on and so forth. So what we do in our work is that we think of very much and on these different ways on how the surroundings we have in all these different perspectives, you know, in the different senses, it actually impacts you as a, as a person. And how can I give them to you in a conscious way as well, in such a way that you then can use them proactively to actually accelerate or, you know, your learning. Because if it all comes, you know, to the bottom, if you say, why would you actually send a child to school at all? If you ask me, you know, then they're different. I mean, because, you know, you can just play outside with the other kids and you can learn a lot, you know I mean? So, and you interact to by coincidence with, with adults, you know, in different ways. I mean, why would you actually take a whole group of kids, more or less the same age groups and put them in one particular place, you know? I mean, why would you do that? Now, there is, uh, there could be a good reason for that, you know, because there's something happening in this kind of connection in this one particular spot, which makes them grow and develop at, a, you know, in a, what I call in an accelerated rate, you know, they're, they're, they can put, they can develop their potential in a better way. So here, this is the interesting part when you start to think of if you can give people some breaks that they become conscious and actually, how do I you know, in, communicate with you and how can I communicate in different ways? How do I use my intuition, for example, for my own development of learning? How do I use my sense perception in relation to my learning? Yeah, and so on and so on. We call it about the awareness of learning or I say learning how to learn, but in the next level, not on the basic level, just knowing how to, I don't know, make a PowerPoint presentation or find something on science on, of science on Google and be a critical evaluator of the information, but the next level, how can I actually maximize my human potentials, you know, in order to accelerate my own growth as a person, etc. Now, this is a little bit what we do. So when we start designing, we make these bricks and we put them in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system, if you want, in a in a kind of a conceptual way, so we can have communication with the people we work with, and we explain this to them, so they understand that, uh, at least at a certain to a certain level, they understand this, and they can proactively start to work with this. At that moment, the physical environment becomes this, if you want, tool for learning. I mean, real tool for learning, or the third teacher, as your book, you know, was uh, called one time. By the way, do you know what one uh, young guy one time told me? It was really nice. <laughs> it was cool. I was saying, I said, yeah, you have the first teacher, second teacher. What do you think is the third teacher? And, and then the guy just goes like, Google? 
<laughs> one of the kids. They go, yeah, yeah, you sort of write the fourth thing. So now today we always talk about the fourth teacher, you know. <laughs> So, so there, anyway. there's some good questions off to the side sure. here. Um, mm -hmm. David Jakes, why, why don't you ask your questions that you had uh, written on the in the chat here? You still there, David? If not, I'll read it out loud. All right. Yeah. No, I am. I am here. Um, this is thrilling, Roseanne. Thank you so much. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, so, I wonder and. Um, and maybe it's sort of a meta question for designers and architects generally, but how do you design spaces that are sort of plastic enough that they can evolve with, with um, you know, new generations of kids coming in with, with future ideas about what the space should look like to, to uh, promote wonder? How can you design them plastic enough? Did I understand that? Yeah. Sort of, you know, uh, malleable or or uh, ah. adaptive, right? Yeah. To, okay. To change. Yeah. Okay. Well, I tell you, I think there are, there's a the answer is a bit variated. I mean, first of all, it's like you know, some people talk about timeless design. I don't believe in that. I don't think that there exists any timeless design. I don't think that, and also don't think of design as a solution. I don't think you can make a, you know, a design architecture or interior design, whatever, and say like, okay, this is a future school. There you go. You know, I mean, that doesn't exist, period. I think that the most important thing that you give to a community when you work with design is a part of, of changing the learning in community or environment or what you want to call it you know, is, uh, is about putting it into motion. Yeah, that's the first one. So it's around making people actually start to experiment, to iterate, to try things, try something else, to kind of create this looseness. No? Um, the biggest problem in school is not only that it's, in a, a, you know, about the control. The other biggest problem is that people are very afraid of doing anything wrong, you know, especially the teachers. And they, they, they infect the whole community with this, this, this yeah perfect you know this disease one could say so so what you do is that you do you have to design certain things you make them very flexible or white cube type you know and then you know you can go in there and we call them the you know you can improvise and you can you know so which are really stimulating you for improvising because i mean there's basically nothing and you can put it make it the way you want and then other parts yeah of the physical environment in and outdoor you know should actually push you into a certain kind of, you know, setting. Why am I saying that? Because I believe that if everything is flexible, you know, there's always somebody that takes control and then has to take control and has to be the master that, okay, we set the tables like this or the chairs like that, or we open the sliding doors or we close them or whatever, you know? So a lot of our designs have a very distinguished, you know, kind of look and feel and even function. And then maybe if you you don't want to use it in a different way, you'll just have to improvise actually, but it forces you physically to do something else. Why is it important? Yeah. Because the change of mindset does not only come because I tell you or because you read it, it also comes through your body, yeah? Um, if you want, I can actually, I have this, I did do the five slides uh, you asked me for, so I just, can I show one photo? Okay, just a very quick, because I think it's a very nice photo that very clearly, and I think that I did the before and after. It's a public school in Copenhagen. Just a moment, Tick, because I'm going to show this to you. And then um, I'll find her here. And then I think it's kind of nice because it shows you a little bit what I'm trying to say with the flexibility in a different way than most people talk about it, you know? So this is before. You're going to see before. Yeah. This is this public school in Copenhagen. It's before. And this is the same room after. Yeah. So what do you see here, which is very important? You see some kind of, yeah, it's an interior feature, you know, it's been designed together with the teachers and everything. And, you know, it challenges these kids, you know, they're on it and they're doing different things. But at the moment they sit down, they have to think about how do we sit down? You know, I mean, how do we see, how can I see your screen? How do I lay, how do I put my body? And I don't even maybe not do it even consciousness, it, it conscious, it just happens, you know? And in this small moment of transformation, you know, or these small moments, you also become very flexible, maybe not only physically, but also mentally. So, I mean, for me, when we talk about this plasticity, as you talk, you talked about, 
it's a combination. You make the white cubes where they can, I don't know, make a big Matisse uh, painting on the wall and uh, for a week, you know, or, or I don't know, move in and sleep there. And then you make the other part, you know, uh, where, where the things just make you, actually force you into a different uh, bodily uh, expression. Now, is this still going to be there for in 30 years? I mean, I, to be honest, I don't think so. I hope so not, you know, but, uh, but it did move them into a different direction from where they were, you know, before. And I think that is actually, and this is a school in Belgium, but uh, that is actually really important, you know. I mean, and here as well, a photo, you can see the kids moving. And I think that that is actually what a lot of people, and I have a lot of other nice photos there, but this was not the, uh, the slideshow, but the whole idea is that you actually also become flexible if you expose your body into something else. Both movement, I believe that uh, both physically, but also, you know, yeah. I don't know, can be, you know, other senses. The, 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 those environment that you just shown is all about trust, right? It's, it's, it's not about flexibility or agility. It's really about a culture of trust. Um, Jessica has a, um, a question that she wanted me to read. Um, what transformation has um, have you have you observed in the relationships between children, teachers, and parents in the spaces oh, that you, that you have designed? A huge change. Huge change. Huge change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more. it really changes. <laughs> it really changes, and it's really funny to observe. I mean, of course, it's different from place to place, but it totally changes. Um, yeah, what changes have I observed? I mean, there are so many changes, you know, it's also because it totally, it totally changes the, the, the situation of power as well, you know, and it changes the way people interact with each other and communicate, you know, and the beauty of, of, of an environment where people feel trusted is that it pays back, you know, it's like you trust somebody and they trust you and you both grow. And uh, I think that the, Okay, I think that the, the, the most, if I say anything, the most important thing is that actually, first of all, a lot of the, uh, the teachers learn as well. And, and the thing is this, if you, if you get back this, yeah, I don't know, this sense of growth, that's actually really nice. I mean, most people, when you develop yourself, you go through a short period of struggle. And this is actually an important thing. That's why I say it's not always like happy, happy, pleasure, pleasure. No, this is important. And then there's about the reaction you said that some of the guys go in front and some in the back. Some people just hate change or development because it hurts a bit. It, it does. You know, when you really learn something, you were a moment where you were struggling, you know, and it was like, oh, and you were like, that, and, and then you get over it. Yeah. And you got on the other side. And then it's like, wow. Yeah. And it's this, 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 I mean, and I see it every time, you know, the teachers, I see it every time they have to get over this. And then when they get over it, it's like, wow, you know, but it, they have to get over it and they also learn. So the children learn and they change their way of interacting and learning and the teachers learn. Of course, there are problems, like there are also problems today and there are also problems in a different environment. I mean, it would be strange that there are not, not challenges and problems. But so I think the biggest change I observe is that People get a different relationship to each other because they both learn. And that is very, I don't know how to, how to, I mean, for example, the school I just showed you in building in the, 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 this is a, a, the school in Copenhagen here. It was really nice to, 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 to follow. We, we really worked together with the, the teachers in the municipality and we had this uh, people following the um, psychological, um, you know, um, kind of a level of the kids and so on, because they were very worried that they're going to be the, the contrary, but so we, we have a lot of data on that. So what happened there was that, you know, when I talked to the, the teachers after a while, they said, okay, first we tried this, then we did this, that went well. Then went, and then, you know what, that one day I discovered that when I talked, I told the kids what I wanted them to learn, then it actually suddenly went so much better. So instead of trying to, you know, wrap it into little bits, you know, they just said, okay, in the end of the year, I want you to speak French. Great, said the kids. You know what? I think I'm going to do like that. And I like, what do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? And then suddenly yeah. <laughs> they were taking in a little bit the teacher by the hand, you know? And it's this kind of change of roles. And then the teachers, they were like, well, okay, I'll take me along, you know? And then this is the kind of change, you know? So that's what happens. And another really big, big change is that a lot of the schools, which is the hardest part, is that we also change the way they organize themselves. Yeah, this is the hardest part, yeah? 
And one of the things is that you don't have necessarily a classroom structure. This is what everybody's afraid about. And I'm sorry, I wrote this book and it says, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I have one standing around here. Well, anyway, it's no more classrooms. I mean, I really mean it because the classroom is the, the structure of the organization of control, which is frozen into the, the, the traditional schools. And I'm sorry. Yes, it's difficult. It's complicated, but no more classrooms. So what you see when you start to do this change is that this, this community is more, much more fluid and, and different in size and allow for more differentiation and for different social structures. And that means for a lot of kids that they find many more friends and they feel much more comfortable in this. Instead of that, you get a lot of, you take a lot, a lot of the psychological kind of social, mm. you know, tensions and social um, bullying, for example, things like that. And, and a lot of schools are afraid that the opposite will happen. So it's a bit funny to see that. And in that sense, you could say a little bit like looking at a prison, it's like you give more space and less bullying happens, you know? So the, the fluidity allows for, social structures in a way to function better. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so you're, what was the question again? <laughs> I, think, I think one one of the, you know, kind of the tension is, is there a balance between um, pragmatic, like in the context of that, that space that you just showed, right? That school in Copenhagen, the questions will ultimately emerge like, how do they take tests? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, so, so in, in some way, the rebelliousness of you comes out in, in a lot of these processes, right? Because you are like really pushing for a whole system change, not just spatial change. Hmm. Space just maybe start to align with the aspirations of the, this entire community and the ecosystem of space needs to change as well. Well, yeah, but I mean, we turn just around the question, you know, we say, okay, what are you here for? What is it you want? And, you know, the why? And then in, and then we turn, yes, we create an ecosystem. And in the end, the, the solutions are different. I mean, to be honest, a lot of our schools, they cannot avoid doing tests. I mean, what I just showed you is a public school, you know, I mean, they just have to do all the, they do the tests just the way as everything else, you know, and then they arrange themselves, you know. Um, I didn't put in a plan drawing, I can't show you, but, you know, it's not that it's all open and you can't do anything and then they're just for one and there's a temporary kind of uh, you know hard mo moments they do the test but to be honest i mean no i mean to be honest i mean it's a bit funny i have one of my sons he's in the u.s right now in new jersey and then he had to go there and uh, you know and then they they have to that you take when you do your senior year in high school there he's doing his senior year in high school there and then he had to you know you take your results from here over there and they compare you know and I mean, he's not even finished, but he's already beyond, you know, it's like for him, it's like, okay, it's absolutely nothing to do, you know, I mean, <laughs> he's already past his first year in college and, you know, in the level what he's been doing here. So it's like, so he's doing all this, what they call APEC courses and things like that. It's a totally different ap approach, you know, so, so, and it's not because they don't have tests and it's not because they don't learn and it's not, I mean, it's like, the thing is that, and I'm not in favor of tests. Mind me, I really think, I mean, I'm very much in favor of the growth mindset. And I really believe that it's about, you know, the effort you do and the growth you make instead of the results. I think it's very negative thing of our educational system that we have this test system. And, that, and if you ask me personally, my opinion should yeah. be eliminated. Yeah. But the fact is that what I do, I'm also, I'm not a utopi utopist. I am a realist. I mean, what I'm doing is that we, what I do we do, it gets built, it's there, yeah? This is the way you, in my opinion, you change society. And that means that you, yes, you have to figure out how to make it work, yeah? That means that maybe it's not a, you know, there are always some kind of things that maybe are not perfect, but it is happening and it is changing, you know? And it is changing in all these different places. And that is more important than be perfect. I mean, and then you also have to realize there's something very important, even if it's not perfect. Yeah. And this is also about a mother. I can show you, I show you, can I show you another image or is this like out of, yeah, no, just go, go very ahead. quick. Go go uh, it's just a, another one I'm just going to show to you because I mean, this is, um, I can go a bit back and forth there in a moment. This is because uh, this is very nice. Uh, this is a school in China. Which is so nice, you know, with all the China bashing lately in, uh, 
in the US. <laughs> That's, you know, no political comments here. It's just that uh, not because I'm in favor of everything that happens in China. It's it's a Western Academy Beijing, so it's also a rather international school. It's uh, because this whole school that has all this different, where there we worked with all these different spaces. And this is actually a space where everything is 50 centimeters. So when you're working with your math, you really get an understanding of things, you know, because, you know, even the, the floor is, you know, matched with the ceiling. So you can actually build this kind of vector word based in, in the space. And this is just a little part of it. It's the middle school and you have Newton's chairs, you know, as a reflection on Newton. And let me see, now this is in Argentina, wait. And then, you know, you have all this kind of equipment where they work, you can write the tables and that is like day beds. Anyway, it's a physical environment which really allows for a lot of, of, of different shaded kind of spaces and you know, and kind of independent work and from the students. And uh, and of course they have tests, you know, and they're doing really well with their tests, but they also have a different shade environment where they're allowed to work much more independently and more like self-directed. And then one of the things which is really, uh, which is really touching was a mom that came to me after, you know, we had this official opening a while after some of it had been finished. And then this mom, she comes to me and she tells me like, she's so happy because her kids, this one part, you saw the, 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 the black and white floor and this, this environment over there is a, is a community with design, technology and mathematics where they can do some stuff there. Anyway, so she comes to me and she says like, oh, she's so happy for, the, the, for this new work because her son, he hated, he hated mathematics and you know anything that had to, the remote smell of anything to do with that. And now he's just so happy to go to school. And we're talking about like a 14 year old, you know, kind of teenager. And he just loves going to school. And, you know, and, it, and she said like, and, he, and his test results are brilliant. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so his mom was really happy. So, and it's not because the kid thinks that the text is, test is important. He just created, we created an environment where he feels much more motivated. And I think we have to remember that even if not everything is perfect, just because you feel better, you know, socially, you feel better, you feel more free, you can relax, you can interact with your friends, you feel trusted. So, you know, some of the things you also do, do the dishes washing, or you do some things you don't like, you know, but you don't think so, they don't feel so heavy, because the whole setting, you know, there is also some joy in it. Yeah. And your life is not just one depressive kind of repetition of things that you do not enjoy. So this is a, in a way, in that sense, yes, joy is part of it. Play. Play is your is is your intrinsical motivation, you know, mm. allowing you to imagine things and do things. Yeah, and then sometimes parts mm. of the play are a bit hard, you know. So I mean, so in that sense, I really believe that this motivational thing, you know, yeah, and then the shitty test comes and then they get good results because they're just a little bit more motivated. You know? mm. Hey, Lee, so I want I wonder if you wanted to ask you a question and then we can wrap up because I think what Roseanne's talking about might answer part partly your questions, but I wonder if you wanted to. Ask her directly your questions. Alka, did you hear that? that sorry, yes. I'm sorry. I'm like I couldn't find my mute, my cursor to to unmute. Right. So my my question was really accounting for just students with learning differences, cognitive differences, affective differences, as we start to kind of undo the structures of school, we also know that kind of different minds, different personalities sometimes benefit from that. And so I'm just wondering how in your conversations and work with schools and communities, you balance those different kinds of considerations so that we don't go from one extreme, which is all about control and locking you in to the other, where mm. another kind of learner might find themselves Kind of unable to cope yeah well like I, I said a little bit earlier i mean of course this is a bit of superficial way of communicating of some things here you know i mean we do try to to create you know in a way we call them algorithm of uh, of learning or you know of situations so you create you know different learning situations in different ways uh, and then on top of it, there might be a space planning structure. Yeah, so you have, uh, which kind of creates the, the big lines and then in it, there's a differentiation of spaces with different categories. But the, 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 the key of it all is that there is place for differentiation. That means that you have, you know, you in a way, there's also more space for different types of learning and different people. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't mean everything is open. I think that is really important uh, message because, 
what we at least experience is especially with children when there are uh, you know some challenges present you know uh, that are that uh, actually this kind of you know, you have different needs. Some children need to move much more, you know, for example, they need a higher level of activity. Now they can't do that. You have to try to, they have to, you know, you have to try to control them because then they disturb the kids that need more quietness, for example, you know? So how do you combine these this two, you know, typologies or two kind of personalities or needs, you know, in a, in a same kind of spatial environment? Well, you don't help them by put them in next to each other in the same environment, because then either one has to adapt to the other, you know, one way or another, and it's bad for both. What you do is create a space where one can be quiet and the other one can go move a lot without disturbing the one that has a quiet need. So the key, and this is a bit, you know, writing it down, cutting what we call cutting it out in paper, but what it means is that you differentiate, yeah? And this is the the, 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 the contrary of the way we design schools or offices or our society, you know, and this is kind of the, what we earlier talked about this, you know, the transformation, if you want, you know, from how we have seen society. I had one more other little funny slide because like the five ones don't work. It's just a very quick one, which is a bit funny to see because this is something we did in three months and it's an office. So that's why it's a bit funny. It's in Portugal and Lisbon. It's called the Sharing School. I love that title. So here you see this office, you know, and this is just the way it got. And they had three months over the summer. And then this is just after the summer, three months later, same space. We didn't have money or, you know, to do the whole facade. So it's very simple. But what you're actually seeing here, and this is why it's interesting, you know, apart from that, this furniture allows for different groups, but also different ways of communicating and separation, you know, you have this kind of small pots here. Here, you actually go into another space behind it where you can be alone, etc. So just in this one little spot, you know, you have a lot of differentiation already where you can be alone or you can choose to be with the group, which is, for example, often for a lot of kids is also there's no place for privacy or pulling yourself out of the group. You're, you're public all the time, you know. You can never, you know, you cannot arrange your public, private, uh, I would say, there's no gradient, yeah, in it, in our school environment. The same thing with being quiet and moving a lot, loud and so forth. Um, so, and this is the, you know, this is a uh, office. We did the same things with offices, you know, there's nothing new about, uh, about this uh, in that sense, you know? So I think that for us, it's not about creating open spaces. It's about creating differentiated spaces, allowing people to be different, basically. Well, I know that it's late and you probably are just getting ready to go to bed. But no, now I'm all awake. Thank, uh, but, you. Uh, no thank, you. thank you for coming and thank you for having this remarkable conversation with us and hope hope uh, to have you back and i hope to see you um somewhere in the world pretty soon um together not not by zoom so uh thank you roseanne it was wonderful seeing you wonderful hearing from you wonderful um it's kind of hearing your learning journey throughout your whole career yeah, and it was uh, really nice seeing you too again. And uh, same from here, you know. I hope our song lines meet soon. Let's try. <laughs> and you, you have uh, any closing? Yeah. So let's 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 have a short two-minute close where we can bring everybody's voices in real quick. And the the invitation I'm giving you all and you don't need to share anything but if you're if you're so moved i'd love to know what is the what idea or what question as a result of this conversation is bubbling up in your head right now we're not going to be able to answer it but just to give us and to give one another a little bit of a glimpse into how people are thinking so just take yourselves off mute we're only going to do it for two minutes and let's just hear what are the questions that are occurring to this particular group of people before we all scatter. Oh, I have one. Um, I completely love the differentiation, especially how we saw the, you know, the rounded cubes sort of the, at the other side. And so my curiosity now is that's public space. And so much, so many of us are on Zoom now. How do we do that differentiation in the Zoom space? So for example, some people like to do reflection with music, others don't. How do we manage that? Just throwing that up for conversation for future. Hmm. 
What else? Just building on Annette's point, I think it just raises an interesting question, which is the distinction between trying to build spaces that accommodate everyone and building the capacity of individuals to understand what they need and to sort of like make that space for themselves. And it, I just, it, it's two different sets of skills. And I just wonder how we balance those two since we can't ever get anything perfect. What else? How about one more and then I'm gonna wrap us up. Yeah, I'll throw in one. I, I'm struck by connecting this with um, the, what you're talking about in terms of space. I'm interested about what the what it means by what Dan Siegel or Annie Murphy Paul would say about you have to decide what you think a mind is, and you have to make a decision about the relationship of the mind of what that is to the space. The other part is the physicality of it, which is really interesting to me. Um, and then I think the other big question you have to have is you have to decide what you think intelligence is. And what then you have to, once you, once you ask those two questions, which I don't think we do very often, then I think what, what you're saying, I love, love everything about the physicality of the space. I'm really interested in the notion of elevation of the, the literally where your eyes are um, in different places. And like in a painting where your eyes go to and how that works in a space. And I can see it in your spaces that you've obviously got an artist's view of that. So thank you very much. Rich grist, y'all. And as I said in the chat, part of why we now have a dedicated network space is so these sorts of conversations can continue asynchronously. So I just shared that link in the chat. And I think this is not something we've said explicitly before, but I think going forward, a way that we can continue to marinate on the central questions a particular event sparks is in that event listing on the network. So if you're still interested in sharing ideas or tossing out a question to the folks on the network, just go to the spot in events where Roseanne's event is listed. And that's where we know we can find other people that want to continue the conversation. Um, but again, Thank you to Roseanne for staying up late. Thank you to Lee for facilitating the conversation. And thanks to everybody for making the time to show up. A reminder again that next Wednesday, we have another early start with Jeff Duncan Andre at three o'clock Eastern. And every Friday at noon, there's the Seed and Spark Community Council. You are all always invited to all of the above. Have a great day and we will see you all down the road. Bye everybody. I her book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Roseanne, thank you again.